We're going to do the, uh, the, the very fast uh, uh, lightning rounds. So I ask the students to, to come down. Uh, when I say students, they're grad students and postdocs, a variety of guests as well. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rocky, and I'll be presenting a poster on one-shot imitation learning. So there has been a lot of pr exciting works um, on imitation learning or learning from demonstrations, like flying helicopters or learning to tie knots. What they all have in common is that they learn separate policies for each of the tasks involved, and in turn, they require a lot of demonstrations for each of the tasks. In this work, we want to have a single policy that can achieve a wider variety of tasks with only a single demonstration. And we achieve this by training it, by training it on a lot of training tasks. So as an illustration, the different tasks can be stacking blocks into different patterns, and the policy will take a single demonstration of the task and the observation of the new situation. And after training, it should know what action to take. So this is an illustration of the learn policy in action. Um, the right is the policy uh, executing on a new situation of stacking blocks into several towers, conditioned on the demonstration given on the left. And the bottom is showing several, uh, several attention marks learned during training. For more information, please visit our poster. Thank you. Oh, it's playing. Uh, hi, I'm Marvin, and this is some work that I've done with some colleagues here at Berkeley and also at NASA Ames uh, in trying to learn control for tensegrity robots, which is a class of robots, as you can see here, that are essentially rigid rods connected by elastic cables. And currently, NASA Ames is pretty interested in this class of robots for planetary exploration because they have some interesting properties in terms of being able to withstand impacts and deformation. But they're actually quite hard to control compared to, for example, a wheeled rover. And so in this work, what we did is we uh, learned control uh, using a novel method uh, in simulation for this particular robot called the Super Ball. And here, we can actually show that this learn policy is able to generalize to different conditions like uh, double gravity, half gravity, uneven terrain. And then because of this, the policy learned in simulation can actually transfer directly to the real world without, without any fine tuning or learning in the real world. And for more information, please see my poster. Thanks. All right, uh, so earlier today, uh, you guys have seen lots of great stuff about doing learning that's uh, doing awesome robotic stuff. Uh, this is an example of some recent deep learning that OpenAI did. Uh, they tried to have a boat that learned how to race, and they ended up with this policy, because they rewarded it for getting points, and if you guys can see, it's spinning around in a circle, and it gets a point for each of those turbo things. The upshot of this, is that uh, at best, deep reinforcement learning and similar approaches reduce the problem of generating useful behavior to the non-trivial problem of designing a good reward function. So at my poster, what we're going to be talking about is ways that we can try to figure out what the right reward function is and make that problem easier for system designers. We set up an experiment where we have this domain called Lava Land. So we're thinking that there's a designer creating a reward function for this nice 2D navigation world. Uh, but in the real world, there's lava that shows up, and the designer is not able to think about that in advance. And uh, what we'd like to have is robots that can sort of know what they know about what's good and bad in the world and choose to automatically avoid that. And uh, one of the things we get is uh, negative side effects avoidance. And if you want context and details, come talk to me. All right. Um, for those who know Ugo Rosalia, <laughs> obviously I'm not Ugo. Um, unfortunately, he's in class, and I'm here to cover for him. Um, so what I, what I would like to do, uh, to do is I would like to talk about um, learning model predictive control. And the reason Ugo has developed this framework is that in classical learning, it is very hard to, guarantee, uh, to provide safety guarantees, um, at least in theory, right? So we usually, for example, when you consider autonomous driving, it is not clear as we update our control policies how uh, is the controller we get still safe or not. And for this, Ugo has de developed this uh, very nice control framework. Um, he, uh, he calls learning model predictive control, and uh, he would like to um, show this on a short video. So the main idea in, uh, in learning model predictive control is to start with a safe task that might be conservative in a certain sense, but then update the control policy as the controller gains more and more information. And uh, well, in practice, in a, in a, you know, in a race track, this means we would like to complete the um, lap as fast as possible, which we do by increasing the speed of the car. So this runs at 0.25x. 
and while you know cutting corners. And if you look at what's happening, this is exactly what the controller does. And I think the main takeaway message here is that we can learn without sacrificing stability guarantees as well as recursive visibility. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is joint work with Polkit, uh, Alyosha, and Trevor here at Berkeley. Um, so rewards in Yelvada are really sparse, or sometimes there might be no reward at all. As uh, M.O. Todorov described in his talk today, this is uh, the rewards that we are familiar with in reinforcement learning are not really uh, feasible in real worlds. So in this project, what we propose is our curiosity. Uh, we propose a model for curiosity to drive agents uh, by its own intrinsic reward. So you can uh, replace epsilon random greedy in the current algorithms like A3C, TRPO, etc., with this curiosity exploration. And it gives a huge boost over the uh, current uh, algorithms. But more interestingly, in scenarios uh, when there is no reward at all and there is only curiosity, the agent can still learn to play the game or learn to explore the environment by maximizing its own intrinsic curiosity reward uh, without needing any external reward at all. Yeah, for more details how it works, come to our poster. Um, hi, my name is Greg, and uh, this is our work on uncertainty-aware reinforcement learning for collision avoidance. So our motivation is that we want to have a robot, such as a quad order or a car, and we want to be able to just throw it into the environment with no assumptions about it other than the sensors that it has. And what we want to do is learn how to navigate. But what we're going to, our key idea is that to learn about collisions, you have to actually experience these collisions. But we actually want to do this safely. So our, what our approach is, is that we learn a collision prediction model that goes from the current observation, such as an image and a sequence of actions, to the likelihood that's going to collide and an uncertainty estimate. Then using this model, we want to minimize the kinetic energy, so we don't want to collide. So basically, if you predict collision or you have large uncertainty, then you're going to move at low speed. You might experience collisions, but once you do, you're going to learn that this image and these actions led to that collision, and then hopefully you're going to get faster and faster. So what we show in our experiments is that when you have uncertainty, you collide uh, at lower speeds, and also that we're able to learn successfully a policy that navigates. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Josh, and this is our work on constrained policy optimization. So the idea here is that we want to do some kind of policy search method that enforces constraints on the policy behavior during learning, possibly for reasons related to uh, maintaining safety while learning. So we develop a local policy search algorithm that does this and enforces the constraints at each policy update. Uh, we're able to show for our uh, optimization update that we can guarantee some approximately monotonic improvement on return and also guarantee uh, some approximate constraint satisfaction. We test in a variety of environments for a number of different kinds of agents and we're able to show uh, in tasks where we might want to stay in a safe area or avoid clutter in the environment that we're able to do this successfully while still maximizing reward. If you have any further questions, please come see the poster. Thank you. Okay. Hey everyone, uh, this is our work on a hybrid systems approach to tracking control of a fully actuated biped. And so what we're trying to do here is actually take this fully actuated biped model we've created and model it as a hybrid system where at every step that's taken, we have an impact and we switch the legs. And what we're doing here is we're, uh, well, it should be animating. But anyway, we're projecting these virtual trajectories and having the biped track those. And so where we want to uh, incorporate learning into this is having at each impact learning about the surface that we're walking on and also how to generate these trajectories so that we have the model uh, tracking whatever trajectory we'd like so we can do actions such as walking upstairs or anything else like that. And I wish that this would play, but I guess I don't have any animations. But. For more information, uh, come check out my poster. Hi. So I'm Jaime, and for a while we've been thinking about how we can get uh, all of these general uh, learning algorithms out there into the world with real robot systems, which are physical systems that can break. 
Uh, and so obviously you need to reason about safety, but not just uh, reason about safety based on some model of your environment or even based on some prior uh, simulation based training because any of those might have a reality gap with the world. And so what we need to do is to have some form of online reasoning about when things don't go the way we have them modeled. So what we have down there is a fan that's blowing air uh, that was not uh, expected by the quad rotor. And what you can see is that the quad rotor that's staying there um, has actually detected an anomaly uh, because it's able to reason about its own uncertainty uh, not explicitly just about the model, but rather about the guarantees that it can give about its own safety. Um, and it does so in a Bayesian framework. So if you're interested in figuring out, uh, learning about how this works, please come see the poster. Thanks. Hi, so uh, we'll show a poster about multi-level discovery of uh, deep options. So the question is here is how to automatically discover temporal extended skills. Uh, um, for, for, uh, from demonstrations of trajectories. So we have trajectories that are demonstrated to us and our approach is on the bottom left there. We segment these uh, trajectories, then cluster the segments, then imitate learning, for, do imitation learning from each uh, cluster. And um, this just falls out of a generative model for the data that we uh, optimize, we maximize likelihood with an expectation gradient algorithm. And we can repeat this principle for deeper hierarchies. So we can learn uh, the lowest level options and then fix them uh, to get higher and higher level skills that use these lower level skills. Um, and if you want to see some uh, cool results, please see the poster. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sanjay Krishnan. I'm a graduate student here at UC Berkeley. So surgical robotics is one of the most exciting opportunities in uh, robot automation. If we can make any progress in assisting human surgeons with some form of limited autonomy, it can improve it can improve success rates, it can reduce fatigue, and so on. But one of the hallmarks of uh, surgical robotics is deformable manipulation. And deformable manipulation is often hard to model completely analytically. So we've been looking at how do we use a combination of simulators, like a finite element simulator, plus simplified analytic models to actually bootstrap learning on these simulators. So uh, come see me at the poster session. We have videos where we've actually applied this on uh, intuitive surgical da Vinci robot using uh, synthesizing tensioning policies to assist cutting trajectories. Thank you. Hello, I'm Michael. Um, we talk about imitation learning. So I'm interested in this idea of uh, off-policy imitation learning, where you collect a bunch of demonstrations, train some sort of neural network policy, and then roll out this policy to uh, automate the task. This is useful for large hardware companies, uh, such as Ford or Caterpillar, and also when you can teleoperate a robot, which we have the systems in our lab to do. However, there's a problem with this approach, and it's known as the covariate shift. And what happens is the robot is going to make slight errors as it's executing the policy and deviate far away from the demonstrations. Uh, if you see here, there's a plot where the off-policy approach performs quite poorly compared to other methods. There's a way that people account for this covariate shift. And the idea is the robot's going to try things out and actually uh, enter these failure modes, and then a human's going to provide retroactive feedback. However, there's a lot of problems with this approach. It's difficult for humans to provide this retroactive feedback. Uh, the robot can visit very dangerous states. And also, it can be hard to actually build systems that work well and can paralyze data collection. So what we have proposed in this uh, paper that I'm going to talk about, a poster section, is to inject noise into the off-policy method, which can actually alleviate the covariate shift. And the intuition here is that noise injection simulates errors as you're collecting data, and then the supervisor can provide corrections for it. We then propose an algorithm that adjusts this noise term based on the robot's performance. And come by my poster, I can show you some uh, experimental results and videos of us applying this. Hi, I'm Jeff Mahler at the Auto Lab at UC Berkeley, and my research is on the Dexterity Network. So I'm interested in the problem of generalizing grasp across many objects, uh, as is motivated by industry. And this is challenging because the number of possible objects a robot might encounter can be growing and changing over time, as in the home, and due to sensor noise, missing data, noisy measurements from a connect. So inspired by growing data sets and uh, increase in learning accuracy and vision, we decided to leverage uh, 3D models available for 3D printing 
um, and generate a large synthetic data set of point clouds and graphs, 6.7 million, using analytic models based on physics, break graphs into positive and negative examples, and use deep neural networks or convolutional networks to classify graphs as robust or not from the point clouds. Uh, we were able to apply this to the physical robot and actually deploy it without any physical trials on the real system, so learn just from simulation and add surprising generalization accuracy to things like deformable objects and piles of objects. I look forward to discussing this more with you at my poster. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Feresha Sadeghi. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Sergey Levin. I'm going to introduce CADIS QRL, which is a flight controller for collision avoidance. I uh, learned by DeepRL that um, although it's entirely trained in an unrealistic CAD environment, it can perform collision-free flight in the real world. Um, we found out by highly randomizing the rendering setup at the training time, like uh, changing the textures and lighting conditions, have a variety of uh, floor plans and objects, we can uh, actually uh, learn uh, a flight controller that uh, can uh, generalize to unseen environments, which can be uh, more realistic uh, simulation environment or real world. Um, and uh, we have multiple rollouts at the training time. And for more details, please come by my poster. Hi, I am Pulkat, and this is joint work with uh, colleagues at Berkeley. Okay, so one way which would be nice to like train robots to perform complex tasks as if they can see a human demonstration and learn from them. So what we are showing in this video is that a human provides some supervision and then the robot tries to copy it. So over here, Dian is trying to tie a knot and you record images of this process. And then the robot tries to copy this and this is one shot. So this robot just executes these actions after seeing the demonstration which Dian gave, right? So how does this thing actually work? So we have like a supervised learning phase where the robot kind of performs random actions, just like a kid. And it does this for a long period of time. So it just performs a lot of interactions. And once these interactions have been performed, then we go on and learn the inverse dynamics model with this data. So the inverse dynamic model just takes image one and image two as inputs, and then tries to produce the action which the robot needs to take. So as you can see on the bottom, you get a human demonstration. And between each pair of images, you can execute an action to follow this particular demonstration. So this is showing one more video of how the robot works. So you can kind of give any demonstration, and now the robot will try to copy it. And this approach kind of also works if you have uh, new ropes, which you have not seen before, not as accurately as on the row which was trained for, but it works to some extent. If you're interested in knowing more about this work, please come to our poster. Hello, I'm Haran. I'm going to talk about reinforcement learning with deep nature-based models policies. So in, uh, normally, in reinforcement learning, if you want to maximize the total number of uh, the total reward, then you end up having a deterministic policy, which is like pi of s equals the max of the queue. But actually, and that's why I, actually in practice, people, people will have uh, the single model Gaussian policies uh, to replace those uh, these policies. And But actually, that re uh, loses a lot of information because you can have a lot of policies that are actually not optimal, but, but also kind of useful. So if you have an entropy regularization term in the objective function, they will end up having this uh, policy that has this energy-based form, which says that the policy is expon uh, is proportional to, to the exponential of the soft cube function. And that actually gives you a multimodality behavior, uh, which is useful in some cases. Here, I'm going to show you a video. Hopefully, that will play. So on the left is a policy that you train with uh, the normal objective, which is the, the, the total number of rewards. And on the right, uh, you have an attribute regularization. And if you have that, you can have a policy that is uh, that can uh, uh, explore uh, uniformly in all directions. So for more details, come to our poster session. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Colleen, and this is joint work with Abhishek and Andrew Liu. And um, 
we are interested in the problem of transferring a skill from one robot to another. So imagine you have a robot that can perform a task and you want it to pass it to a new robot. You can't just copy the same policy because the state and action spaces are going to be different. And so in order to be able to uh, guide the new robot to learn your task faster, we learn uh, feature spaces for each of these robots uh, in which we can easily translate the task. Even though the states are different, we're going to learn to ignore the parts of the states that are different and, the parts that, and instead retain only the parts of the states that are comparable. And using this method, we're able to tra uh, transfer tasks from a, a torque-controlled robot to a tendon-controlled robot, as well as from a three-link robot to a four-link robot. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vijay, and I'm, uh, I'm from UC Santa Cruz. So my motivation for using radar was essentially when vision data is uh, unavailable or it's noisy. Um, um, as you can see, I have some experimental data on the left where I've used radar to pull out information of range and velocity. Uh, and that's my obstacle detection. My obstacle avoidance is a gradient descent controller uh, using a hybrid model on top of it. There should be some animations which is missing. Uh, the red dot, the red circle around the vehicle, uh, as you can see, is the radar detection region. When it detects an obstacle, it creates a barrier potential uh, which pushes the vehicle above or below. And uh, if it's in a region of stagnation position, as can be seen in the third, uh, on the third image on the bottom over there, the radar detection region is reduced until a space is available for the vehicle to go through. Uh, for, 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 more, for more questions, please come to my poster. Collecting data on physical robots is challenging and expensive, um, but we have access to 3D simulators which are easy to use and cheap. Um, so the question that we're interested in is whether we can leverage 3D simulators to learn complex robotic behaviors and then transfer those to real robots. Um, so the idea that we explored is pretty simple, um, which is whether by randomizing the simulated environment enough, um, the policy that's learned or the behavior that's learned could be general enough that it just works in the real world. Um, and so we applied this idea to, uh, to the problem of detecting objects. And these are some of the results that we were able to get in the real world. If you have any questions, please come see my poster. Uh, hi, my name is Justin, and I'll be presenting exploration model exploration with exemplar models. Uh, so in this project, we tackle the problem of exploring in high dimensional spaces. Uh, most exploration methods require building some sort of generative model over the state, such as a dynamics model or counting. Um, so we instead uh, perform exploration by training discriminators to classify recently visited states against previously visited states. And the intuition here is that if a state is easy to classify, then it's novel and you should encourage the policy to visit that state more often. Uh, we can also show that in some sense this method is approximating uh, count-based exploration. So we evaluate on uh, several low-dimensional tasks and uh, an image-based doom task, but the video is not showing. Um, and on the doom task, we outperform existing methods. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Saurabh Gupta, and I'm going to today talk about my work on cognitive mapping and planning for visual navigation. Uh, so what we want to do in this uh, project is drop a robot into a new environment that it has not seen before and uh, allow it, and, and we want this robot to be able to navigate in this environment which it has not seen before uh, and achieve tasks such as uh, go to a particular location or go and find me a chair, uh, semantic objects of interest. Uh, traditionally, this problem has been approached by studying the problem of mapping and planning. So mapping is you reconstruct the environment, and once you've reconstructed the environment, you start planning paths in this. Uh, and this suffers from obvious issues, most particularly that there is complete ignorance of uh, semantics that exist in the environment. Uh, what we're doing in this work is essentially designing a neural network architecture, which can do both mapping and planning uh, together. So we have a spatial memory, which has the ability, which uh, uh, essentially builds up the map of the world. And then we have a planner, which uses the spatial memory and is able to plan paths given partial observations. And of course, this is all end-to-end -end trainable, which allows us to leverage the semantics of the real world. Uh, for details, come to my poster. Thank you.